This is literally going to transform your life. And what I love about belief coding is there's a process. It's really clear and easy to follow. I've had many forms of therapy and this is definitely by far one of my go-tos. So if it's, if it's for anything else, I'm not even using it for my business, I'm using it for me to heal myself, to work through blocks, to build that sense of self-awareness. You know, trauma isn't always with a capital T. It doesn't have to be huge and big. There's more little T traumas um, in our lives that make us who we are and um, buried in those traumas are set of belief systems. Just taking part in the process has changed the way that I view everything that I do. It's just been such an adventure. Um, I think the person I ended up helping the most so far is myself, <laughs> which is not what I was expecting. The energy and the love and the support absolutely found my tribe. It's amazing. You're going to transform your life and every single person that you use belief coding on one belief at a time. Hello and welcome to the Love, Peace, Truth, Karma podcast. I'm your host, Leanne Brown, and today I have got the incredible Becky Gibson. She has been speaking out about this whole situation, a real freedom, freedom fighter, a mother and a public health advocate. She just wants everyone to have informed consent, make their own decisions. And um, I think you're going to really love this podcast and you'll make sure you've got a pen and paper because you're going to want to write some notes. <laughs> Enjoy. If you're in China, you just know it's corrupt. They want it, they want it to be like that here. People are pretending to be 12 year old kids, mate, and they're not. Yeah. They're 40 year old men. Now we're getting bombarded with all these death numbers, but there's no context there. You've got one child pregnant, you've raped many others, and we had evidence to prove that. Do you think evil still exists today as it did back then? And the answer should very simply be yes. So Becky, thank you so much for coming on. I finally pinned you down. Thanks for having me. You're reluctant to do it. <laughs> Bit nervous, yeah. Yeah, but you're yeah. absolutely fine. I mean, we've just talked all the way down on the cam, not sure. And there's nothing left to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> we have to relate all now yeah. to remind you. But yeah, so you were so amazing for me. Um, you know, in the beginning of all this, like people asked me, what was the beginning of you starting to question things? Um about the medical industry, about the world. And, and for me, it was um, my, bre my breast implants. Um, I was going to get them replaced. And then I just randomly got a DM on Instagram about breast implant illness, mm -hmm. started to look at the symptoms of it and realised that they were relating to a lot of the symptoms that I was experiencing. And then sort of started looking into the explant. Um, and then, of course got more friendly with you and then realised you were also having an explant yeah. just before, okay. mate, with yeah. the same guy. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that's um, universal intervention, isn't it, that Definitely, brought us together. Yeah. Um, and then obviously leading on from that, the HPV, and then just literally spoke out saying, do your own research. You were so good in just all I the think, stuff that um, you sent to me. I think with any of this stuff, it's always the trigger. So there's one thing for people that just makes them question. And then after that, you're in the rabbit hole, aren't you? Yeah. And, um, so for me as well, the breast implant illness was a major trigger for me to start questioning everything proactively, not from a negative standpoint, but just to try and really understand how these kind of mistakes are being made. Are people making informed decisions? Um, have I made informed decisions? Yeah. And I was I so, definitely didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we were young again. <clears throat> yeah. And um, that's one of my main areas of passion now is to speak not only for the children but the young people and just make sure that they're you know making informed decisions because in so many areas they're just not and it's frightening yeah. really um me and you both learned the hard way with how sick we became I don't know if you were as bad as me I don't think I um, was but I actually went into my explant surgery genuinely not not knowing if I was going to come out of the surgery that's how ill I was um, and at this point, I was the mother of um, a nine-month-old baby and a two-year-old. Mm. So, you know, for me, the passion is to speak out even when it's a bit adverse and, you know, you get criticism, but I don't want anybody else to be in that position. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the breast implant illness, it's like a lot of people listening will be like, what is What's that? breast implant yeah. illness? Because so many are so unaware of it because it's not publicised. Nobody talks about it. Um, 
within the the surgeons. I mean, the vis surgeons actually just only do explants now, isn't there? Yeah, I think they're starting to acknowledge. Not sure if it's it's one of those things where there might not be the formal medical research because obviously it's not going to be funded. Um, that's a whole other rabbit hole. Yeah. But the surgeons are unable to sort of deny what they're seeing, which is this catalogue of you know, sick women who then go on to heal. So yeah. it's that's great. the thing. They have them out. It like even even Guy who did our surgery, he's yeah. just like, there's no actual concrete evidence that it's a real thing. Yeah. But he's seen a lot of women that have had them had the implants removed yeah. and then been completely like feel differently and everything's disappeared yeah and I think you know a good thing to touch on would be like some of the symptoms that people can experience because I'm sure there'll be people watching this now like oh shit I've got implants of what's going to happen to me and it's interesting because you could apply this to all areas of of medical science where what impacts one person won't to another we're all individuals with individual DNA and different toxic loads and histories and stresses and all these different triggers so you know it's not to say that anyone who's got implants I mean I personally would never advocate for them again is going to experience these symptoms but it's definitely a lot more common than we're led to believe Mm -hmm. Uh, I've got young friends sort of 18 19 that are like oh exactly like I was I'm gonna have my implants and I'm like oh my god and they've just got no idea that this even exists no um so so tell us about your symptoms Yeah, so I think one of my first main symptoms was probably just tiredness. Yeah, me too. Um, From a young age, early 20s, just constantly being tired. And then it's it's kind of that old, yeah, well, you know, you're going out and drinking. Mm. And I'm like, yeah, but so is everyone else. And I'm really tired. I was 18. Oh, wow. Really really super young, young, yeah. Yeah, And it was was crazy because I didn't even need them. It was just like everybody did. And, you know, um, hopefully we can talk a bit later about judgment and shame and stuff because that's something I'm really passionate about. But for me, I just wanted to fit in. I just wanted to be like everybody else. And it was that kind of Katie Price era. And it's just what everybody did. It wasn't even, it was just cool to do it then. And we just did. Yeah. Um, And, you know, it felt great, but I started to get tired and this was like a chronic tiredness that seeped into like my early 20s. And then anxiety, um, kind of like this weird stealth anxiety that would just, I'd wake up in the night, my heart would be racing. Um, I'd just be worrying about things. I'd just, just generally anxious. I'd get like stress rashes and just feel anxious all the time. Um, And people would be like, oh, you need to just sort of book book up. There's nothing wrong with you. You've got a nice life. And I just, you know, became fearful of just random stuff. Um, And then just started to develop like health anxiety, this feeling of like impending doom, that something was going to go wrong. Um, Brain fog was coming in, like couldn't remember stuff, just, just felt out of sorts. And then this sort of progressed when I, so that this is when I sort of discovered about breast implant illness um, properly yeah. and realized maybe I'm not crazy, there's something going on. Um, and then I felt pregnant. Um, before that came some fertility issues as well. I was told I might not be able to have children. And I did some detoxing, which probably really helped me, although I was never going to be fully able to detox with these implants in for me but you know I was able to have children but that then trapped me into keeping these implants for another four years because I breastfed both my children which was a major concern to me learning Mm. about the issues around them and obviously feeding but I decided I would um so it was really as soon as I stopped breastfeeding my second child I was like get these out and by this point I was like kind of virtually bedridden um I didn't leave the house really with my kids I couldn't go to baby groups and stuff. I was just exhausted. I had neurological issues. Um, People were sort of saying things about MS to me. I'd have numbness in my legs, my hands, tingling, eye floaters, like pain around my head. What's eye floaters? So it's like when you sort of say there's a bright light on or just any light, daylight, you'll see like black. It almost looks like there's dust. Um like tadpoles, if you like, mini, you know, all floating around and you can't, if you move your eyes, they'll move with it. Right. It's toxins in your body, basically. Wow. Um, and they really impact the nervous system and especially your eyes. So anyone who has vision issues. Um, but this does sort of stem into general illnesses that particularly women are experiencing that maybe don't have implants. And this is a whole other thing. I think for me, the implants were just a trigger possibly okay. um for some underlying stuff okay um and as and when I've spoken out about this the amount of women that message me and they're like oh my god this is exactly what's happening to me yeah 
I had a huge response as well when I spoke yeah. out about it. Like I said, mine weren't as severe as you, but I had like t- tiredness, not chronic tiredness, but I was always tired. And it was my joint pain that really yeah. I really suffered with as well. Yeah. yeah, a bit of brain fog, tired eyes, watery eyes and um, just being puffy allergies and, yeah allergies like yeah. all year round it wasn't just a hay fever thing it was like I would sneeze I would itch I would like and it was just constant yeah uh, well and, you've got a foreign body that's what I was just gonna say and yeah. body wants it out so yeah in, it was the medical medium have you have you read his yeah, book yeah absolutely so he, he was it. really like insightful to me so explaining like the reason why our implants are obviously a foreign body and our, our livers that sends enzymes to latch onto them and yeah. it causes them to be porous so mm-hmm. ultimately they're, they're going to be broken down and there's this kind of myth that people say well no you know they're not, they're like the old implants that yeah. were silicon and I haven't got silicon implants mine are safe yeah um there is no safe implant no uh, even people that have hip replacements and knee replacements and mesh you know these are still foreign objects in your body and this is what I explain to people not everybody's circumstances are the same so there's this risk v benefit analysis which comes with absolutely everything Um, and this is just another example so I think we spoke about earlier some girls messaged me saying you know I actually believe what this and I've read about it, but I'm just petrified to have these implants out because my whole identity and I'd feel suicidal. Yeah. Well, you know, that's a shame in itself and something that needs to be addressed. Yeah. For our daughters, for yeah. our young people. It's a, probably a whole nother podcast. Yeah. But it's a deeper issue, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It, it's all about empowerment, which is, as you know, probably my, the main driver behind me speaking out um, is not breast implant illness but but just the general empowerment of people yeah. especially our young people and children standing in their truth and power and it's a shame that people feel like that but obviously naturally they have a very different risk fee benefit analysis but what you don't realize when you're young because you don't have the hindsight of wisdom is that you may go on to be a mother and mm-hmm. then you know your whole demographics of what's important changes and suddenly you wouldn't care if you lost a leg as long as your child was okay but you need to be there for them yeah and that was the thing for me I just literally hit rock bottom because I was like what have I done for for vanity or just silliness I guess in my opinion for me it was not necessary mm. it wasn't like a reconstruction or anything that's different again but um and then the, the PIP going on to the is it PIP yeah the, the ones with the recalled yeah they were given to people with mastectomies, yeah, and because of the the fur texture, yeah, and that's how the cancerous cell cells like sit in between yeah. the, and that just blew my mind that that was going on that they they, they were recalling. People them. just don't understand the process uh, and the failings in medical science. I mean, I'm not here to say that medical science is trash. I mean, we have incredible when when you're in a life saving situation, drugs and medicines and surgery and all this stuff is you know. If, if you've got a child with cancer, like who could call this? is not miracles that they're working. But what's happened like with everything is greed has set in and you, you can always trace it back to like who's making money. Mm-hmm. And in my opinion, there's just not nowhere near enough funding into the long-term side effects of these things. Yeah. And at the very least, they should be informing people that are making these decisions of that. Yeah. And they're just not. I mean, I remember when I got mine, I was like, oh, is this safe? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like millions of people have them. Yeah. That doesn't mean it's safe. But you told that they would last a lifetime as well, because uh, I yeah, was. Yeah. yeah. And 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 don't they come now with it? There was some law changed, I think, but the, so they now come with a black box warning, but we wouldn't see that. The person sitting on the other side of that, that desk doesn't well, see it. it's, it's the, the same with um, many things that are going into our children. Yeah. They come with black box warnings. And, you know, that's not to say that they're definitely going to do something bad, but it, what it means is we don't know. Yeah. And for me as a mother, that's not good enough No, for me. I mean, I, I get it. You know, we don't know long-term side effects of things, but again, it comes down to informed consent. How can you make an informed decision a decision for yourself or your child if you simply are not given this information and I think that's where it comes down to for me um it was an unattractive prospect to start speaking out about this thing there'll be people that say well you know you're just trying to make a name for yourself or whatever it, I don't need to do that and it would be much easier for me psychologically in some ways yeah. to just stay quiet and just take care of myself but I just couldn't sit here and allow people to be making these decisions completely unaware of what the risks are yeah so that's where I'm at you know I really want to try and raise awareness and empower people to just start looking a bit deeper yeah and that's um exactly what um 
the, the same reason I, I ended up saying about the, the HPV. And, and like I say, when I started to ask you and then you sent me all this evidence of all, all the injuries that they, that had caused and, and just alone by putting the post out to say, just do your own research. I was just astounded at the backlash that I got from yeah. that, which really is shocking that we're so fearful to actually, like you're saying in the car, like, you know, to go against the narrative in any sense, it's just horrific how people just come down on you. Yeah, I think it's it, it stems into something else that I'm very passionate about, which is consciousness. And I think that what you've just described comes from a place of fear. Um, and when we have this level of consciousness, which keeps us in fear, we don't like anything that could, could you know, you think some of these people that are coming at you, they've given the HPV to their child. So you have to sort of, sympathize with them in a way that obviously they don't want to hear that mm. um and that's the ego and you know it's very difficult for people to say have I made a, a wrong choice for my child I mean the one thing we all have in common irrespective of our views is the utmost you know we want the best for our child yeah, so this is where we have this is where this all becomes difficult um and this kind of one di one dimensional approach to everything I see it over and over if you question anything you're anti this you're anti that so you know oh what's my individual risk of COVID I'm gonna oh you're an anti-vaxxer okay oh, I'm not sure what's not sure about this in Russia and Ukraine because you know look at Syria and China oh you're you're pro-Putin it's yeah. like this crazy so it's the same with the HPV um actually do people know that HPV is a virus that 99% of the time your your body, body will clear as it yeah. does with all viruses no they no they don't in general yeah. know that because it's the they, they just, just think the it's can yeah. cancer yeah a, it's trigger in front of it's it, a trigger behind of it yeah. do parents that are injecting their 13 year old daughters know that it's sexually transmitted not in the main so this all changes our our, our decision making mm. so you know if your child's not sexually active I mean perhaps the education should be around safe sex yeah as opposed to let's just inject children for this just in case this happens you yeah. know and that's where I my fallout comes with these systems because again it stems back to money it's a multi-billion dollar industry yeah um and I'm sure that once upon a time vaccines did incredible things in certain places but people don't seem to want to move away from the fact that it's different now um we have sanitation we have central heating we have nutrition awareness um you know everything's clean our water's clean we're not living with sewage all around us as other places in the world are yeah you know like so they have a different risk throwing back to the smallpox thing oh well it cures some smallpox and then it was the Susan Humphreys that you put me onto as well yeah. dissolving illusions yeah. and reading that recommend that book to anybody it's interesting because all these vaccine preventable diseases these childhood illnesses and um, we have vaccines for there's a plethora of other diseases that we don't have vaccines for that have also sort of done this yeah. on the graph so it's it's and I'm I'm certainly not trying to say that none of the vaccines have been responsible for a decline in infection or disease but again it, you have to look at that in depth and I have and what seems interesting is that and, and let's just apply this to COVID while we're on this note so we're looking at measles and all this kind of thing but let's like bring COVID into this as the vaccines introduced the death rate from the virus decreases um, but the prevalence of the virus doesn't. So people are still being infected more so than when the deaths were up here, but people aren't dying anymore. And, you know, interestingly, that seems to be what happens with all viruses. Mm -hmm. They they tend to evolve to become less dangerous to humans. So when you're introducing, and if you look at what happened with measles, it's, it's a really interesting graph. The measles vaccine comes in and sort of claims all the glory yeah. for what's naturally happened with, with the virus. Now, that's not me, because instantly I get that, oh, you've got no idea. People used to be blinded from measles and they died and you just you're just stupid and you've got no idea. Yeah, but that doesn't tend to happen to people anymore just like people don't die in the same way they did two years ago from COVID because the virus is less virulent now. So well, people argue, well, that's because there's a vaccine for it. Right. But how long do vaccines actually last? At best, 10 years, do they? Well, you know, I think it's fair to say that with with various vaccines and we can look at the COVID one and, and I'll get backlash for even saying this as well, but it does feel to me that if you were a very high risk or an elderly person, in certain stages of the pandemic, if you had that vaccine timed right, you may well have 
benefited in some way from severe disease or death, but we still don't know. You know, I'm not conclusive either way on that. We're not going to know for a while. Um, And also it's very difficult to track the virus. You know, we need to look at the world data and see what happened in countries that didn't. And that's all becoming clear now. Um, But certainly young people, you know, and children, it, I just, yeah. And you know what? I have no issues in people taking a stance against me for saying that because I feel so strongly about it. Um, Speaking my truth on that is not a problem in regards to the backlash. I think it's absolute insanity. And what's interesting as well is the people who give you the backlash seem to have this belief system that people like us are just uneducated. Mm -hmm. Um, We don't know what we're talking about. We're not a doctor. And as we were just saying earlier, you know, neither are our leaders. You know, these people have got no medical background, but mm. what they're doing is they're choosing which experts they trust, the same as we do. And there's this plethora of vaccinologists and experts in resp- respiratory viral illness who are all speaking about this stuff, similar to Dr. Dr. Susan, Susan Humphreys, which I'd recommend everyone reads her book, yeah. Dissolving Illusions. Um, She was a mainstream doctor who vaccinated children for 30 years before she started to realise something was amiss. Um, So it's really all about what experts you... The flu flu vaccine, wasn't it, that she started seeing people like uh, with kidney failure and stuff? Yeah, I think, you know, what's happened in the industry is greed. Um, You know, whereas vaccines used to be very specific to, you know, diseases with very high death rates and now we see them for all sorts of things and it's not to minimize those diseases but you know how many people if 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 they're saying that all people over 18 should have a covid vaccine well how many children at 18 die from covid and you've got to look at that data before you just go around giving medical interventions to them yeah um for sure and there is and like you said there's there's doctors and scientists forming whole alliances against this it's not just you know rebecca yeah, Rebecca, the, the crazy YouTube conspiracy theorist exactly. or whatever we get coined as. That's not where I do my research. Um, and I'm in a network of many, many high profile doctors, nurses, journalists who all feel just like me, um, but they feel that they can't speak, speak out. out right yeah. now, which is a shame. Um, so going um, back to like I give my children all their immunizations without even realizing um, any of this. So it was much later on when I um, discovered that, you know, the dangers of them and actually what was in them and, you know, how much they are protecting our children or us, you know. Um, And I just wish I'd have had that education before, which obviously you just have said it time and time again, we we just trust blindly anyone that's the doctor or a nurse that they they know exactly what they're talking about um but they have very little education don't they when they're training yeah, to be doctors it, again this is where the backlash will come straight away or oh, you're saying this about doctors no 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 doctors and nurses are incredible at what they do my yeah. mother was a nurse for 35 years um but it doesn't make them experts in vaccinology. Yeah. It's, it's different. And many doctors, I have GP friends who self-admittedly have got no idea. They they basically trust the science. And <laughs> science. we're all well-versed to that yeah. now, aren't we? Trust the science, follow the science. And yeah. that's what they do, quite rightly, because, of course, they should be able to trust that science. I mean, that's the whole point why it's there. But unfortunately... Um, there are things amiss in that industry. And that's not to say that the scientists working on these products are trying to do anything wrong. Um, There is just no long-term screening of data. So the yellow card scheme, for example, VAERS, where you report adverse reactions is massively underused. Most people aren't even aware of it. It's also very difficult to pinpoint um, an injury for a child because they can be slow onset or they've had multiple things happen. Vaccines are given in multiple doses now as well, so it's very, very difficult to know which one caused an issue or did they even cause an issue. Um, There's thousands of parents who have the same stories of my child was fine before Mm. and now they're like this. They've stopped making eye contact or what have you. And this is a very taboo subject um, that I almost feel reluctant to talk about because it just infuriates people. And I get it. You know, most people like yourself have made those choices for the children well, they've not made the choices, they're blindly trusted. And I don't say that disrespectfully because that's what we should be able to do. And that's where my passion comes back to real public health 
because we should be able to trust the science. It isn't, it is a job of parents to make informed decisions, but it isn't the job of parents to try and be experts. And, you know, we need our experts. We need uncompromised, you know, experts. And I think people are starting to see, and this is the silver lining from the last two years, that actually lots of our experts are compromised, um, for various different reasons mm. and it blows my mind that people are willing to accept that as in general but not when it comes to x y and z oh they wouldn't do that mm. and yeah. I'm like okay <laughs> yeah yeah it's um the words and this is where language comes into it as well the, the words safe and effective are thrown out there you know on the back of the vaccine, you know, like that, that that's in just ingraining people. <clears throat> and you yeah. see it now with obviously the advertising, safe and effective, safe and effective, safe and effective. Um, but you decided not to um, give your kids any. Yeah, I mean, for me, my, my decision for my children, and I don't sort of widely speak about it um because I'm not the only parent to them. And there's there's all kinds of issues that come there. And and also, you know, the stigma for them is outrageous. Um, I sort of this is why I wanted to ask you, like, <clears throat> what kind of um, well, you've seen how's it, it affected. You've your, seen it. People the, have lived that over the last couple of years, like what I live mm. with all the time. Um, if you make a decision outside of the box, you are crazy, mm. right? So, but for me, I, I'm so grateful. There was something in my gut that was just like research this a little bit further, make this choice for you and your child. Now. Bearing in mind, I was someone who was suffering with this mystery illness and I saw so many doctors and specialists and had so many blood draws and stuff and no one could tell me what was wrong with me. So I was in a unique position where I naturally began to question everything anyway and I'm grateful for that. And I think it's out of all this suffering that comes the growth, you know, and they can mm. apply that to everything in life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we have to be grateful for this stuff. Like, I, I'm not angry that I went through that. I'm so grateful I went through that because my children are going to be, which mean the world to me, are, are the product of that. So for me, I was obviously more reluctant, I guess, than most to just blindly trust the doctors because these doctors were the ones who told me everything was okay with me, who told me that these implants would be fine, who that there was nothing wrong with me, but mm. I was suffering with all this you know, anxiety and depression and all this stuff. So, yeah, so when the when the kids were coming along and I made, I'd made i already made my mind up before I even had them, you know, I did all that research and that's where people come unstuck. I get all these messages from people. I'm due next week, shit, I don't know what to do. And I'm like, okay, this is heavy for people and they shouldn't be in this position because it takes quite a long time to read through all this data yeah. and, you know, really come to a conclusion. But for me, I... I didn't feel that the risk, the risks that are potentially there for my children were outweighed by benefits. Yeah. Um, that's not the same as me saying I'm anti-vaccine and people have to understand this is two different things. I'm very, very pro-choice and some people do things naturally and some people don't. So I'm somebody who, if I was diagnosed with cancer, I'd explore every natural exactly. avenue before yeah. I took chemotherapy. Yeah. I respect that not everybody is. Yeah. Um, and I have no judgment on them. And I and in return, I'd like them not to judge me. But that's where we're struggling, right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, so for me, I like to raise my children naturally. If they get a fever, they don't have calpol. And um, this is something we've spoken about. Yeah. Um which blow my mind actually when you told me, because I had again completely unaware, like paracetamol depletes the liver's ability to detoxify yeah, itself. Yeah. Like, which uh, is one of the main things that needs to happen when you're suffering with a virus yeah. or potential bacteria yeah. in the system. So if you just the fever is actually an incredible part of the body's response. It's showing you oh that your God. child's body's doing what it needs to do. Yeah. So the temperature rises and burns the virus off and stops it from developing potentially into something more serious like meningitis. You know, meningitis is a secondary infection um, that comes after other viruses because they've been allowed to sort of get into the blood. So for me, I start to think, well, this is crazy. Um, so this fever comes in a child and then all this fear surrounds convulsions and things. And actually, um, one of my my children has a tendency when she gets a very high temperature to kind of sort of begin to convulse. And this is going to upset people, but this convulsions, she doesn't have a full-blown seizure, but they do start to get twitchy and, you know, and it's actually part of the body's process. Um, for a child to get so hot, they get brain damage is virtually unheard of. It's just that your body is such an amazing mm. vessel. 
it yeah. doesn't do that. Um, so if we allow the the, fe- the fever to rise and spike, in my, in my view, and I've got two children now, that's always a, a very quick end to the illness. They don't progress into like these prolonged illnesses because really what you're doing is you're just suppressing the body's ability to fight say, yeah. it. And then you're going to need antibiotics. And here's another crazy thing that, you know, kids are being dosed with antibiotics for viral illnesses because doctors are now so afraid mm. of not treating or mistreating a child because yeah. of all the red tape. And we're wiping out children's gut floras and all sorts, mixing it with, you know, cowpol, and that stops them being able to detox these toxins that come. It's just an absolute, it blows my mind yeah. that this is happening. Um, if my child had toothache or a headache, would it give them paracetamol? Absolutely. Now, this is different. And again, this is where people are like, oh, you don't, you know, this is evil what you do. No, the fever is there for a reason. If my child was in pain, it's different. Mm-hmm. And I have to battle this with schools and all sorts. You know, it's it, it's hard. To be outside of the box is a difficult thing to be. Yeah. But I wouldn't change it. Um, no, do you know, the, I was going to say, I've seen an advert for Calpol, which just it basically was and because of the coloring and the strawberry flavor and it's like people like I've done it you know I've given it to my kids yeah, it's like, like heroin to, for children yeah, isn't it? <laughs> you know even my kids who don't they've had it on the odd occasion if they've had like one of my daughters um she fell and cracked her back tooth in lockdown and obviously it wasn't safe for her to see a dentist and the poor child like she suffered so badly with pain so when we really had to of course we'd get we'd give her yeah. and she had this cowpole and and she still asks me for it now right. I'm not well mummy can yeah. I have kelp on my tooth sore yeah. you know and god like isn't that another great example of of just life in general yeah. like these the way that we, these kids are getting wired to. Well, even on the advert, it said, if your child is out of sorts. Yeah. It didn't even say if they're in pain or they've hurt themselves. It just, there were the words that were used. And when, after this is after you told me that. And I was just like, wow. The, there the is actually, um, you know, what's crazy about all this is the actual advice is usually in line with what I'm saying, but they sort of don't encourage you to look at it. So, you know, at one point it was, and I don't know if it still is on the NHS website, that you shouldn't use things like paracetamol to suppress the fever if it's unless it's accompanied by pain. But you go, you go and find me one parent who knows that. And that's not because the parents are doing anything wrong by the child. They do it in hospital, don't they? Right, so we've been there. I mean, um, a few times my kids have been to A&E, and again, I'm so grateful for that facility it's not that I'm anti-establishment in that in that way when it's needed it's incredible but it's, it's just not always needed yeah and I've been there with my child it's a, a good story actually I'll, I'll try and tell it short um, my daughter was 10 months old she had a raging fever um and I was just I, I was like I was a new mum I had this knowledge but I was like okay that something's not right she was kind of lethargic so I went to A&E have you given a cowpole no, because I don't know what's wrong with her. Like, can you, you know, what's wrong? Um, da, 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 da. She needs to have cowpaw. She needs to have cowpaw. I was like, well, no, the fever's, you know, doing a job. What's the reason? Tell me. That, no one could tell me. Anyway, so we get through and turns out she had tonsillitis, um, which is a whole nother podcast as well because it's to do with strep bacteria, which gets passed down and results in many of these symptoms we spoke about linked to breast implant illness. But anyway, she had tonsillitis and they were like, she has to have a 10-day course of antibiotics. I said, okay, well, 99 times out of 100, tonsillitis is viral. So, you know, I've breastfed this child for, for nine months, so I don't really want to just give her antibiotics yeah. and wipe out her whole gut flora. You know, that's really detrimental to a child. Nope, she has to. This is definitely bacterial. Okay, you're going to swab it? No. Well, why would you give a, a 10-month-old baby 10 days of antibiotics, which is really bad for the health, um, without knowing that it's bacterial? So after a huge fight... And five different senior pediatricians telling me that this was 100% bacterial tonsillitis, I agreed to take home the antibiotics. And I have no shame in saying that there was she didn't have them. Once I knew she had tonsillitis, I gave her high-dose liposomal vitamin C and she was better the next day. I needed a diagnosis because, you know, you can't take risks with children if they do have meningitis or whatever. Yeah. So she was better. Um, wow. They told me it'd be 48 hours maximum for this swab result. I rang the hospital every single day. And after three weeks, I eventually got through to somebody that told me the swab was viral. And I was like, my child literally could have had 10 days of antibiotics for nothing. And if you think about how How much that happens. Yes. 
And interestingly, she, touch wood, hasn't developed tonsillitis again. And tonsillitis is one of those things like ear infections, which just seem to reoccur in children. And this is because the body's never learning how to fight these infections because yeah. we're dosing them with everything. Exactly. So, you know. You know, you were telling me as well about the... Um the figures of the children that hadn't had their immunizations compared to those that had um, and <clears throat> the, how healthy they were and how many times they'd had, they, they had become ill. Or There's very few studies on it for obvious reasons and it's right. one of my bugbears and this is why, you know, I'm a huge advocate for real public health and I really want to go into that sector and I'll I'll be trying to do whatever I can to get into that sector and unfortunately it's going to probably involve some formal education which I'm going to find quite difficult Mm. um like because of who's funds it and stuff but you know I'll do what I need to do because these studies what is the reason why they wouldn't exist I mean it should be uh, you know we have an epidemic of of spectrum disorders and just general ill health the highest rate of cancers we've ever had in children I'm certainly not sitting here saying that's all caused by vaccines but um like anything there can be triggers and we need to we really need to be getting to the bottom of what's going on um and people really get outraged with people like me and you for speaking out about these things but all we want is the truth yeah um <clears throat> I'm certainly happy to be wrong if I am yeah um and make the right choices for my kids. But how can I make an informed decision when there simply is no data? Yeah. No formal data. So you go and look for it. It doesn't exist. No. It just doesn't exist. And if you speak to a doctor about it, your GP, they don't know. They don't know either. You know, you can ask some questions about these things. What's the recommended allowance of aluminium for a child? I don't know. Well, how much is in there? I don't know. Even like asking them the ingredients of them, and they they're unaware of them, aren't they? Um, yeah, and again, doctors, like we have to know. be careful because um, I hate when people try and coin me as somebody who's you know against doctors and medical science. I'm not. You know, doctors can be incredible under the right circumstances, yeah. but it's not their job either to be trying to work all this out. You know, the, the public well, health. Well, I, I, I kind of disagree in a sense there because I feel like if they're administering them to your children they should know what's in it they should know what the dangers are or what the injuries have been to be able to inform the mother before they make that decision but there is just a total lack of awareness that there's even a potential risk I mean that's the level we're at there's a total lack of awareness so but do you think as a doctor you have a responsibility to to find that out well they're under under oath to do no harm but you know then comes the gray area of are you doing harm if you didn't know you were doing harm? And are they doing harm? I mean, I'm not sat here saying <clears throat> you're all poisoning your children. But what I'm sat here saying is we have an epidemic. We have a health crisis yeah. in our young children. I challenge anybody to say we don't, okay? At a time where we've now got better sanitation, better access to, you know, healthier foods. But the education's not there and the studies are not there. And this this is not just about childhood vaccines. This is about diet. Yeah. This is about lifestyle. This yeah. is about mindfulness, yeah. you know. And suddenly people like me and you are coined as these crazy kind of hippie people who just want to go against grain on everything because we, we practice mindfulness, because we understand the healing benefits of other things. And we've got to get to a point where natural is okay. Mm. So if somebody just in your own body to do the yeah, work it's supposed we, to, like, our body is incredible. Yeah, it's it, and you know this is where it. I, you know, I get so upset about this whole autoimmune thing because people are just being disempowered um, so badly. Yeah, you know, you're being told your body's attacking itself. Yeah, your body would never do that. Yeah, your body is trying to heal you. That's um, what medical medium speaks yeah. a lot about, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, everybody is it should. Epstein Barr syndrome. Is Epstein it Barr virus is, and also strep, so which is responsible for tonsillitis, and the Epstein Barr virus is things like glandular fever. So I'm really passionate about this because what 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 was one of the main triggers for me, which when I went back to me in my twenties, where I started to experience the breast implant illness, what I was already experiencing that, and then a huge trigger, I got glandular fever, right. and I never recovered. And even now... That is something that does reoccur... It stays with you, doesn't it, glandular fever? Yeah, the Epstein-Barr virus will be in your system and it's medical science and research hasn't truly discovered how to deal with it. Um, So you can have a blood test one day and it's not present the next day it would be. 
it's a very clever virus. It gets into your joints. You know, you experience joint pain. Mm. It's, in my opinion, one of the main reasons for arthritis diagnosis. It gets into your organs, which then Im- impair their ability to filter. And what it will do is it will sort of sit there days, weeks, months, decades um, and wait for an opportunity when your immune system is low to attack. And that can be um, a- another virus or childbirth a, a traumatic event like a divorce or a diagnosis of something horrible something bad to have you know in your immune system is down mm. and then the virus will seize its opportunity to just come and wreak havoc and it wants to get to your central nervous system and this is where it where it's interesting for so many people um who are experiencing the symptoms i described before and neurological issues and they end up getting diagnosed with things like ms lupus um these are just labels just to obviously they just mean mystery illness yeah they just mean your body's doing something we don't understand we don't know how to treat it and we're, so we're just going to give it a label yeah um and then people are faced with a lifetime of suffering yes. they're totally disempowered because there's no cures they get put onto medication which is full of things like toxins, which further impair exactly. their organs. Um, so, you know, it's a minefield. And again, you know, to anybody who's listening that thinks that's a load of shit, well, look at what's happening. Mm. Is the system we've got working? Are people getting better? Are we stopping people from getting these illnesses? Or is are, are things just getting worse? Yeah. Um, and for somebody like me, the medical medium was a huge part of my healing. At, he's just incredible. He he does actually have, like, gives you Protocols. the supplements and the yeah. things that can reverse yeah. a lot of the stuff that he talks about as yeah. well, isn't it? Which so is he really gives good. you ways. So when you've got people that are diagnosed with hypothyroidism and things like this, there is nothing you can't heal from mm. as far as he's concerned. Yeah. And you know what? When I first listened to him, I thought, this guy's mad. Yeah. This guy's crazy His because story is once incredible. upon a time, I was just a normal human that just followed all the all the rules in science and my mum was a nurse and you know we were all very mainstream it's not like I was brought up by hippies um and you know when I l- listened to his stuff I was like okay this guy's out there yeah. you know but I'll try it because what I forgot to lose yeah and suddenly just began to heal wow. incredible wow. um but lots of the things he he advocates for is removing the heavy metals from your body which is actually quite easy to do yeah, through diet and, and other supplements and then feeding things that support your immune system like liquid B12, zinc. Uh, it's, it's, it's so easy, but it's not expensive. So again, mm. you know. Were you doing that before you started, to before you found out about the breast implant illness? Were you trying to detox before? No. Or have you done it all no, right? Because no. so, you were, you, you did eat a fairly healthy lifestyle and yeah, juiced and stuff like that I would be before. an example of somebody who, I couldn't understand why this was happening to me. Yeah. Because, yeah, I wasn't perfect. You know, we all had nights out. And, yeah. But I certainly wasn't an extreme, you know. Head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No comment. Um, but, yeah, I enjoyed myself. Don't yeah. get me wrong. And yeah. burnt the candle at both ends like all kids do. Yeah. And actually, it's interesting because that sort of college university era is when the most most people become sick like this. Yeah. And, um I wasn't aware of that. You know, they reckon around 70% of people at sort of colleges and universities are facing some of these chronic symptoms, debilitating symptoms. And um, they just sort of like mull on and, and don't really get anywhere. And then by the time they're 30 and 40, so many people are bedridden. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. So, yeah, I would. the medical medium is incredible. I mean, yeah. the problem with it is um, when you reach that point of being so unwell, it's very overwhelming to start trying to read books or it's like when you're pregnant, it's very overwhelming to start making informed decisions. And this is why I think people just fall into the safety of the systems because there's no accountability. So if something goes wrong, you, you're you the victim. Yeah. And this is what's happened. I mean, COVID's been the greatest example of this. Yeah, exactly. It's just so much easier to be, you know, well, it wasn't, you know, I just did what I was told now. I'm a good person because I did what I was told. Yeah, like the people that are working in the the actual vaccines or the COVID um, sites or, you know, like actually administering them without even contemplating if they was to give somebody the vaccine and then they die after, you Yeah, know, or they have a fit straight after. Or- I mean, I think what we have to recognise is that all the people doing all those things are not the bad people. They're all doing it from a place of love. 
because the people that signed up to administrate them genuinely believe they're doing a great doing thing, right thing yeah. and that's that that's great but that's where the sort of education comes in and the awareness comes in and if people like me and you don't try and speak out then who will mm. who does um yeah even if only 10 people watch this listen to this and then think well I'm going to go and have a little look into that mm. and it changes and you know this brings us into the more I guess spiritual side of things where I think more than ever people of our era our generation have got such a big job to do because our parents are from that generation where it was kind of like children should be seen and not heard you just do as you're told you know, kids weren't allowed to have emotions they were just shush 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 yeah, yeah you know don't be, silly. Stop crying. don't be silly yeah the amount and, of times I've even said it to them stop crying and it's like it's good to cry you know there's obviously a reason behind yeah. it so. oh don't be soft especially yeah. boys yeah don't be soft you know da, da, da. Oh, these um, harmful words we don't even realise that are causing so some small traumas in Trauma, our children yeah. and ourselves so we've, we've got to break the cycles yeah. like we have such huge responsibility um and I won't go in now we haven't got the time to go into what's happening and the ascension and we're sort of ending one era and going into another one and the consciousness is changing as you can see people are sort of waking up I don't like the term but it's happening and it's our responsibility is huge like we have mothers um fathers out there we've got to break the cycle otherwise we're just passing on what our parents did to us to our children and then they'll do it if they don't break the cycle we need to break the cycles yeah so we need to teach our children with love and respect, you question everything. Yeah. Um, you know, and when that, you feel this emotion, let it out. Yeah. You know, don't, because you, you know how detrimental it is to your immune system if you're scared or, and you just keep that in and don't tell anybody. I went through that. Mm-hmm. I mean, the trauma, you, you know, the same, like the traumas that we've had to work through and release. But how about we don't give those traumas to our kids? Yeah. I mean, they're not going to come out unscathed. You know, everyone has to face stuff in their life, but the more we can teach them now to just sit with who they are mm. and connect their actual mind with their body and yeah. it's all okay and, and help them with that, um, the better. And it is unfortunately a parent's responsibility now because the systems, the education system, the health system, are, we're not there yet. No. So we've got to actually now learn from each other, empower each other and you know, start to really, really break down those cycles and it triggers people, you know. My mum, if she watches, won't mind me saying, you know, it triggers her when she sees me with my children. You know, they might do something that we'd previously consider as acting out or spoiled. And I'm like, right down there with them. Tell mummy, how do you feel? Show me in your body where, where do you feel it? Is it here? Is it here? Is it here? And we go through this and my mum's like, oh, for God's sake. And I'm like... (laughs) I'm breaking your cycle yeah. here. Like, give me a chance because I want them to understand it's okay to feel yeah. all this. Um, That's so empowering, Becky. Yeah. I wish, see, I wish I had known more about, about all this before when my kids were younger because I was that mum that was like saying, stop crying. But we're like, under okay. stress. Like, I, I'm so lucky. I still lose my shit now. Actually, we shouldn't say like. lucky because we're all where, where we're meant to be. But I'm so grateful that I'm in a situation where I've got an amazing supportive father of my children who allows me to embrace all this and I have the time you know I've not had a formal employment since since my first child was born you know lots of mothers watching this you know of course it's natural to think well it's all right for you to say that but that's where self-judgment judgment and shame but self-love comes in because these mothers and fathers need to really look after themselves as well and that's where I've started doing my sound therapy so people are like wow that's out there and I'm like you know what we're providing the safe space for people to come mums dads anybody from any walk of life we've got like stew the bricky in there we've got (laughs) this isn't like selective there's no ego anybody can come yeah and you come and you meet other people and it's empowering yeah and you relax and you heal you know we could go into the sound and know you had Marie is it the, ha- the harmonic egg oh yes yeah, yeah. she's amazing yeah. but you know go into all the science behind sound and yeah. how we've been disempowered from that but more so it's just bringing people together yeah and then I spend most days all day on my foot drives drives Jay crazy where I'm just speaking to people and like talking them through and you know that that that's my thing I'm just here I want to help people the yeah. trauma that people are and now even like more so isn't it yeah you know because well of we've got you, now it's it, to me it's not optional now our children have been through so much yeah um are you doing them for children as well the sound therapy 
groups. Yeah, I will be. that's something that would be really good yeah, to, to bring. I will be. I mean, actually, I know your um, daughter's doing the conscious classroom yeah. and I spoke to Chantelle about doing it for them. I think it'd be amazing, but yeah. we've got to get there. And I think the first step is just to empower the parents so that they realise that this is normal, yeah. this is great. Um, like you're saying, Stu, Stu the Bricky, and like, you know, people are now becoming more open to it, aren't they? Yeah, they're, right, yeah. They're, they're able to be, you know, well, once before I was like, oh, that's really weird. And like, like you say, yeah. it's like really not into that spiritual Well, I went to my stuff. first sound bath and I was like, God, this is weird. I mean, this is going to be, you know, really outside my comfort zone. And it was. Yeah. Um, And I left there and I got to the end of the drive and I just burst into tears. Yeah, it's powerful. I had to stop. I was like... Oh, there was just so much. I almost thought I was going to be sick. Mm. I was like, in a good way kind of thing. I was like, oh, where is this emotion coming from? Trap trauma. And I actually swear on my kid's life that my life changed forever. Just in a minimal way. But, you know, you're in a traffic jam. You're just not so angry. Someone comes at you and you're kind of like, okay, you know, let's not react. And we're not, don't get me wrong, there's moments. Yeah, of course. <laughs> we're human. Yeah. But in general, it's just learning to come down and just sit with things. And I think the sound is so powerful for that. Yeah, definitely. Um, but even if you don't feel those benefits, just being a part of something yeah. that empowers you. Yeah. Um, and anybody being can do it. Being a part of something positive as opposed to part of something like following the grain of the narrative of what's been pumped out in the media, which is fear. Yeah, and there's no divide in the, the circles. So I've got plenty of people that come to my sound bass that, that are double jabbed and boosted. Yeah. They're welcome. Like, yeah. you know, I, I, there's no judgment. Yeah. Um, what might be right for me might not be right for you and that's okay, but we've got to get to that, you know, everyone has the freedom to choose yeah. and we can all still love each other and respect each other anyway, yeah. irrespective of our views. That's and something that's like about like raising the consciousness to, to love, but also coming back to the judgment aspect of it. Um, you know, we were talking earlier how we were, we were like branded as wags and, you know, of we've both got husbands that are footballers and that like we've kind of done a full U-turn, haven't we? Of, of yeah. I mean, I've spoken openly about me being, I had a shopping addiction, you know, I, uh, I was, I was just ingrained in just that lifestyle of, of. It's empty really, isn't uh, yeah, it? It's and it's trying to fulfill yourself, you see it all the time. Um, you know, the, the judgment and the shame that people experience is just crazy. And I was saying to you, I have it all the time, you know, people are just committed to like finding that fault with you. Yeah. And it's so sad. Yeah. Um, but hurtful. Yeah. It doesn't matter how empowered you are. It's not nice. Yeah. You know, I was saying to you, you know, I, I'm nervous to come on your podcast because people look at you and they're like straight away, well, you're just this, you're not educated. Who are you to speak you know, about I've that? had yeah. so much thrown at me. Oh, you wear hair extensions, you this. And people say to me, oh, you don't, you want to tell people not to get a vaccine. Not that I ever do that, but this is what they say because they've got this one dimensional approach. But you inject all sorts of stuff into your face. And I'm like, I actually don't. You know, people think I've had my lips done, but actually I have tra trauma mucous membrane on, on my lips, which is from rolling my lips as a child because of anxiety. So, you know, that that that's a lesson for everybody. You don't know what someone's dealing with. Yeah. And some of these women who message me who do have lots of procedures are like, I'm just addicted to trying to be better. I, I'm, I hate myself. I hate how I look. And they think I'm going to judge them because of that. And I'm like, oh my God, yeah. no, like, you know, this is fine. That's yeah. fine. You're entitled to be how you want to be. Um, but as long as the awareness is there and you're making informed choices, then you can do whatever you want. Yeah. As long as it's not harming other people, is it? Yeah. You know, so it's a it's, it's a social perception of how we should look and how, you know, that they're talking about the surgery and the, like yeah. the, the you know, what we people are doing like putting so much stuff in the face and all that but. I've never I mean I, I think just to go back to what you said about our, our husbands and stuff like that I personally believe that everything that's put on your path you know out of the pain comes the good we've touched on that and you have to go through difficult times to grow and I really believe that and you know there's been times where I've sat there and I've thought how the hell did it happen that I ended up with this person because it's making my journey so difficult yeah because instantly people judge you and it's and they won't accept you as for what you're saying because they can just see footballer's wife yeah and I'm like how did this happen to me I'm quite sure I could have married a lawyer or something and then people would take me seriously but I'm like no it's it's part of but the, then you wouldn't have, have done you maybe wouldn't have got to that point just, because it's pushed you to do yeah. that research and same with me it's like Everything happens. For, and it's for teaching people and showing people it doesn't matter what background you're from, what you do, or you 
every single person can empower themselves yeah. and speak their truth. And this is this links into the consciousness thing we speak about where we're trying to raise people's consciousness because people think, well, I'm just one person. You know, what's me coming on your podcast going to do? Well, what's me coming to a sound bath going to do? We're just one. Like there's wars everywhere. There's you know millions of people have had the jab. And you, what can we do? And I'm like, no, it doesn't work like that. It really, really is powerful. Mm. So if you've ever been near somebody who's got a good energy, mm. you're like, oh, I love going out it. with them. They're so much fun. Yeah. And it brings you up. Yeah. And that's really how it works. So if you apply that to yourself, if you can raise your consciousness, you sort of emit this kind of frequency of like fun and love and truth, whatever. So I know that because I'm speaking my truth now, completely like just flowing in the truth that people that are listening to this, no matter how much they want to hate me or judge me, they're going to feel that I'm being honest, if nothing else, Mm. even if they don't resonate with it. And that's what it's all about. And I'm saying to people at the sound baths, through social media, this is not about being anything apart from your truest form. And that connects you with your highest self. And naturally then, you know, the judgment and the shame and everything becomes kind of meaningless and part of the journey. And you're going around there like this little beacon of light. You know, you might be in a supermarket and if your consciousness is up here, all of those people in there, gonna feel it. in terms of energy, yeah. you know, yeah, of course they're going to feel it. We only change by change, change the world by changing ourselves. We've got those people that we? suck the life out of us. Yeah. It's the opposite. It's in yeah. reverse. You don't want to be one of those people. So if you're a parent or you a nurse or whatever you are, it's like the only important thing in your life now, in my opinion, is to raise this consciousness because then you can do everything better and help people better. And we're not going to constantly be in that state like we all get attacked by life. Um, But what I've been through, all the health stuff I mentioned, my relationship that came with all kinds of difficulties and trauma and judgments and shame. And I had people calling me this and that, you know, I was a nightclub, hostess whore and all sorts of stuff and it pushed me to the darkest place because I because I was like that's not me Mm. um I love this person why are people doing this why are they saying this why are they judging me you know even had like members of his family and stuff not his brother and sister like kids and all this stuff going down calling you know oh you're not real because you've got hair extension and I was like oh god I really need to and I was right down there and that's where the rebirth happened yeah. so I'm so grateful for it all yeah. and everybody who's and I think more than ever thanks to COVID is this unique opportunity for everyone to experience this rebirth and now it's like which way do you want to go yeah that's right where we're, where we are yeah so we have to speak powerful. out yeah it is powerful yeah. and every person's powerful you don't have to be a footballer's wife you don't have to be on a podcast it can just be Helping that old lady with yeah. a bag. I know it sounds cliche. Even but like her smile, Becky, is powerful, smile, isn't it? Like, hence why they wanted to cover it up. Yeah. Communication, hence why the social distancing yeah. and the lockdowns, you know, it's almost as if, or just plant this seed, they knew what was happening with consciousness. Yeah. And they realised that I it was so that. powerful. So we've got to separate, we've mm. got to mask. Yeah. Because let's face it, those measures didn't work in stopping the pandemic so why did they continue yeah and this is what they wanted to avoid people watching and hearing any of this because it just empowers them and you know it's it's incredible but there's only so long they can stop it for I just think the truth is a truth Mm. it's quite comforting to see now that there's not that many people wearing still wearing masks but again it's because the government says we don't need to wear them anymore everything's being lifted and it's funny how many people just did consent well and it's, it's interesting rules. for us it's like a sort of visual you know that they actually admitted that the reason for masks was like a visual reminder that we're in a pandemic as opposed to any actual wow. health benefits but you know and I have this not to say argument but with people all the time where they're like well why don't you just wear one because it's just the greater good and I'm like as you can hear from this podcast that would go against the grain of everything I stand for mm-hmm. so that would never happen if I really thought wearing one was going to help you know Dorothy then you know I consider it because I am a kind person I love all people even people I don't like as such yeah. but you know it doesn't so I'm not going to do it I'm not going to signal because that's what this is it's Mm. like a giant psychological experiment to see where people really are and how and how easily can be manipulated and you know this isn't a new thing project mockingbird was a real thing where they were like let's invent this tv and 
people people think this can't be real. It is. They they invented the television, tell at vision yeah. with programs, programming. Vision. Yeah. yeah. Live, yeah. Um to see if they could control the masses. Yeah. And it was they said it would be a success when they can su- successfully tell a lie to everybody through the media and the television and they all believe it. Mm-hmm. Well, welcome to the 21st century. Yeah. But as with anything, the universal law of behaviour is is there's always resistance. So that's why I've never been in fear. And people are like, why aren't you scared? Why aren't you? I'm like, of what? You know, when you understand the universal laws and energy, there's nothing to be afraid no. of. It might be a bit uncomfortable, but so was giving birth and then look what you got. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's not, this is brilliant. This is incredible. Like as bad as it was, it's like, I was grateful because I was like, yeah. maybe people are going to get it yeah. and there'll be resistance. Yeah. You know, anything someone tries to do to you, there'll be resistance and that's karma and, you know, yeah. you might not always see it, but it's there. Yeah, well, I think that's a great way to end. Yeah. Yeah, you've been amazing and very insightful. And obviously, again, we'll just recap over the books, like Susan Humphreys, the Dissolving Dissolving Illusions. illusions. Um, Yeah, so when people get overwhelmed and they're like, I don't know where to start. Yeah. If there's childhood stuff, Dissolving Illusions is an amazing book. And Medical Medium is a great one as well. For anyone, yeah. And also, you know, if anybody is concerned about um the breast implant illness um there's a group on facebook which yeah. is really good and is it uk breast implant yeah. illness yeah. and is that it? I can't, yeah. yeah if you so search uk re- breast implant yeah. illness you'll find yeah. and it and there's thousands of women in there yeah. hundreds of thousands of women in there's, there honestly it's it's incredible and that's that's the uk one isn't it i think there's yeah. there's about there's probably about 5000 in there now yeah. um but there obviously is worldwide ones where you can see but um there's lots of you know, before and after pictures because people are concerned about how they're going to look if they've took them out and it's just yeah. getting back to our our natural self and loving ourselves, like you say, like healing the trauma that caused us to want to do that that to our bodies in the first yeah. place. And yeah, like I know sometimes it's uh, unavoidable or like it's something that, you know, if I had a mastectomy, like would I would be comfortable with just not having anything there? I don't know because obviously it's not happened and yeah. it's, there's a lot of things to consider. But ultimately, if it's making you sick, then is it worth it? yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So informed consent and, you know, just... Pro-choice. Yeah. Or always pro-choice. Question everything. Yeah. Yeah. And just make decisions for you because it's not one shoe fits all. Yeah. And I've never seen a great example of what's just happened. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like, it's not okay to say, well, I'm 34, I'm recovered from COVID. Yeah. I can't see the point of having a vaccine. Oh, you're an anti-vaxxer. Yeah. Wow. So Becky does do uh, sound healing on a yeah. Sunday at the moment do, in yeah. Wimslow. Yeah. So if anybody would like to um, get in touch with her and your Instagram is. It's healing by Rebecca. Healing by Rebecca. So yeah. And it's beautiful. I've been there. I was, should have gone again last, last night, but yeah, it's gorgeous. Yeah. yeah so thank you so much for coming thank on. You for having me. Yeah. It's been yeah. great. Sure, we're going to get lots of questions coming at us now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can handle it. We can. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you.